I am from India, but I currently work in the UK, and uh, I'm I've been working on LGBT rights for a long time now in India mostly. Um, and when the Ugandan bill happened, I became interested in what was happening here. And one of the things that I came across when I was reading about the bill and the situation here was the story of the Uganda martyrs. And when I read that story, I was very surprised by the fact that the written accounts of the story say so clearly that uh, the Kabaka was having sex with men in the court. And that this is a story that is remembered every year and memorialized so much by these hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who come to Namagongo. It's millions. Millions now, right? It's crossed <laughs> over one million years. And so the question I had was, how can people remember the story so well, and including this fact that the king had sex with men in the court, and at the same time say that same-sex uh, interactions were not known in, in the country, in the kingdom, till the West activists arrived. So I started doing interviews uh, with people at Namgongo and, um, and asking them, what is the story according to you? What do you think happened here? Why is this place important to you? Why do you come in here? And I got many different answers, many different accounts of the story, uh, which I can tell you later as, as we talk more. <coughs> um, and my intention was not so much to say this is right and this is wrong, your version is correct, your version is wrong, but to see how many different versions of the story there are, and to also look at the versions of the story in which people are very frank about the fact that sex happened uh, between men in, in the court. And surprisingly large numbers of people were willing to say that, but many people also were not, right? So we had both kinds of responses. Um, <coughs> So really, today is about uh, having a discussion about you know, the versions of the story that maybe you grew up with or that you were taught in school and in church or in your families. Uh, but also how you relate to the story. Does it mean anything to you? Does it not mean anything? Um, is it useful for activism? Is it not so useful? Um, is there any potential to, to do work with the story? On personal levels, some of us have interrogated and you know, we have our own conclusions about it. But as a movement that is very much um, uh, ostracized based on you know, what happened, to, uh, happened at that time, we should be paying more attention and interrogating it further and how we can use it actually for activism. But I think the the, 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 the angle that makes it very difficult for us, or the challenge that we meet is that uh, cultural roots, right, and Buganda being the largest um, monarchy, you do not utter anything against a royal person, specifically the king or the queen. So I, I think it's part of like the Buganda culture where they do not speak about um, Mwanga's sexual you know, activities. But also it's about um, just the fact that as Africans, sex is not up for discussion. Mm -hmm. It's for doing, not for saying. So like any kind of sex. Any kind of sex. So I think those affect the discussion around around this. And one of the things um, for me that has been an issue around the discussion about Mwanga's sexual activities, same-sex relations, was the fact of age. What age was he? Was he a minor? Was he an adult? When it happens, the photos they show us, they show us him looking as an adult. But there are versions of the story that he himself was under 18 and having sex with under 18s and <coughs> above 18s at that time. So facts, of course, those are things that we have to interrogate. And if, and, and if he was under 18 at that time 
and he was having sexual relations with people around his age, but using the power of him being a king, also that has to be investigated. Mm. You know? So then, then, then what does it mean like in present day? These are, these are, these are two minors in exploring sex. And if, if uh, in, in fact, also in present day, the older people he was having sex with would be the ones criminalized, not mm. one. I think right now I have a clear understanding why some of the, or to explain some of the reason why some of this uh, kind of story is either different or why it's being told in a certain way. Uh, first I want to talk about, uh, like, let's say the institution Uganda as a kingdom. Um, I'm very sure that uh, culturally and uh, and uh, and uh, the norm, I'm very sure it was okay for a king to have sex or engage with anybody as they wished, and I think there was pride in that, and people never felt offended, and that's why you see that if you move around Buganda, there are trees that are called Kawakanjaga, which means the king loves me. So basically they'll talk about if a king visited and they saw a beautiful woman and they liked her even if she's married, uh, so the king would just say, well, I can't, and the husband in honor for that would plant a tree to celebrate and say the king loves me and because I have a beautiful wife and the king saw the beautiful wife and there she is. And you find that all this was celebrated and there was no moment whereby people felt like, oh my God, this is like absurd or this is ugly. But I think we should also appreciate with time passing by that some of our culture has been eroded. And this is due to the embracing or welcoming the new culture, which is Christianity or Islam or any other culture that we now have. And I think that also helps to define why the narrative is as it is today. Uh, to the extent that what was original no longer fits to be original. So you have to twist the narrative in order to fit into the new original. And the new original says homosexuality is not right. So that's why you find that even the Buganda institution, if you want to start a war with them, then you should go up front and say your king was gay and you should accept this. They'll tell you no, you're not speaking anything right and you're going, you're, you're trying to rewrite history, you're trying to defame or the, the, the kind of uh, say some things wrong about our king. So you find that even that institution itself cannot stand by its original stand just because the times now say homosexuality is not right, homosexuality is an African. And the people we have right now in the kingdom and everything, that's the kind of narrative they also want to stand with. And I think that's why you find that the question around was uh, King Mwanga or uh, can we use it for advocacy or how can we use this? You find that it becomes a little bit hard because even our own institution that would have come up front and say yes, it was okay for a king to have or engage with anyone sexually, it doesn't stand. So it makes it very difficult that every time you tell this story, it's like you are trying to rewrite history in your own way, which doesn't suit your own culture or your own country. So you find that that really makes it a little bit difficult because the narrative has been, um, uh, has been rewritten. Um, and so if you look at, uh, like, there are within also the Uganda cultures whereby women and who look uh, after the, uh, the cultural shrines are not supposed to engage sexually with any man because they have given themselves to the God and they can't have uh, sex with any man. But you find that these women uh, find pleasure within themselves. But this is something that you never find talked about. The king didn't want them to embrace the new religion. So they had to be punished that way. All this story of um, them being uh, <coughs> a 
or that king also being a homosexual is something new to my life. But now as I've grown, I come to realize in our villages there were there were people who were always questioned and they could uh, they could refuse boys to you know they could uh, they could make sure that boys don't do not go to those homes. Not until I grew up I, I came to know that uh, there was a homosexual care at our village. You get it. And uh, this person now uh, is kind of about, about 90 years is now my parent. But uh, they couldn't talk about this that uh, he, he he sleeps with the women. And they could just uh, make sure that the male kids couldn't go to that. So how did you know? Okay, personally, the first time I had a They used to tell us about the gun matters and everything. Mostly it was about the, their faith. But then after growing up uh, and reading a lot, you come to know that uh, the king had maybe uh, he, uh, affairs with uh, some of his uh, like, uh, courts and everything. So they wanted uh, him to reform. If you don't go away with your ways, you're going to burn and everything. So the king was not happy with uh, what this young men were telling him and uh, yeah he ended up killing them but you can't tell that to this person who is really from, coming from Kenya working on food Namugongo knowing these people are burnt because of their faith the people who brought the bible decided to omit that part when they were giving down the information to the rest of mm. their followers that is why that is the story we know so that's why there's a difference in what the priests tell you and then what the ordinary you know, when they're telling the story. Because the people who brought the Bible to them omitted that text from part of the story. Uh, there was a Muslim uh, sheikh, he's called Hamzata. He recently was preaching, it should be one month or two months ago, and he's saying Muslims should stop calling the king Bafe, which means our husband because uh, that is not right. Church and the mosque are now attacking such uh, culture that is actually ours. Mm -hmm. 